Hey, in the Thick family, it's Julio. And we recorded this week's show on Monday afternoon before the news dropped that Joe Biden finally announced his VP pick. And that's California Senator Kamala Harris. You know, this breaking news happening as we're dropping a podcast. It happens. But listen, we're going to get into what this all means during our Friday sound off this week with Maria Hinojosa and me. We got takes, so stay tuned for that. But for now, sit back, relax, take a listen to this roundtable with two amazing all-star guests. Part of the structural racism in this country has been equally distributed in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. Welcome to In the Thick. This is a podcast about politics, race, and culture from a POC perspective. I'm Maria Hinojosa. And I'm Julio Ricardo Varela. And today we have two ITT all-stars calling in from their homes in quarantine. Yes, yes. From Winston-Salem, North Carolina is Tina Vasquez. She's a senior reporter with PRISM and a 2020 Ida B. Wells fellow with Type Investigations. Welcome back, Tina. Hi, thank you for having me. Hey, hey. And joining us from Atlanta, Georgia is the fabulous Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. What's up, Latasha? I'm so happy to be back. All is well. And we're so happy. (laughs) Yeah, we're so happy to have you back, too. Um, So it's been... I don't know, intense. That's a kind of an understatement. Intense <laughs> That's an year. understatement. Just living here has been intense in this country from the pandemic to racist police violence. I mean, even this Sunday, there was a 5.1 earthquake in North Carolina where you, <laughs> Tina, live. Apparently the largest in over a century. You know, right here in Harlem, trees fell down last week because of the storm. So this is just a very first question to ask you. How you doing? So, Tina, we're going to start with you. How are you feeling? I am tired all the time. Like, I can't complain really too much. Everything is fine, but I'm very tired. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Short and sweet. Latasha? <laughs> Woo, mine would be a podcast in itself if I told you how I felt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Latasha has a new podcast. How am I feeling? I'm, I'm telling right. you right now. Feelings? What are those? Feelings? Um... <laughs> I am. I'm having actually every human emotion you can have. And I'm having an all at the same damn time. I'm angry, sad, scared, frustrated, hopeful, fired up. Every emotion, human emotion you can have, I'm having in this moment. A few weeks ago, I myself actually tested positive for COVID-19. Latasha. And, oh. uh, it was the most nerve-wrecking sweetie, experience. Sweetie, I've been through it, so I'm here for you, sweetie. So Anything you, you understand. need to know. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad that you are well. I had a mild case of it, but I think more than anything, it's the worry, because you don't know how it's going to respond to your Mm -hmm. body. And then I'm worried about people being around me and being around my family. So I am just petitioning for a 2020 do-over. I'm just like, who do I talk to about this? I love that. Yeah, Yeah, I need to talk to the manager. I need to reset 2020. She's a woman, by the way. (laughs) Exactly. I know. So listen, um, I know. First of all, thank you for sharing that, Latasha. And my heart goes out to you for anyone that has to go through that, especially in this time. But we do want to discuss the 2020 election. It's less than 85 days away. Oh, my God. As if we're not on edge enough this year. And honestly, I'm going to come in as the Puerto Rican reporter. I have news to share with everyone in the world. Puerto Rico just had a primary election on Sunday. Complete shit show. Ballots didn't show up to precincts. There's calls of uh, delaying it, moving it to next Sunday. And it's just, it is complete chaos down in my home island colony. And I'm very worried now that this is just a prelude to what's going to happen in the United States on election day in November. But we want to talk about the power of voters of color and the issues of voting rights. The backdrop of this election season is the coronavirus pandemic. There are now 5 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in this country. And the number of those infected has doubled since the end of June. And then we still have to mention Joe Biden's comments last Thursday during a joint National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ, and the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, which was NAHJ, of what he said. 
What you all know, but most people don't know, unlike the African-American community with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an incredibly diverse community with incredibly different attitudes about different things. This completely overlooks these issues of race, identity, ideology, intersectional communities. I honestly think that this kind of Biden statement, the Trump campaign's like, bring it on, oh, because God. it's just going to be used to divide and conquer Democratic voters. So last Thursday, August 6th, was also the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Not that that was like front page news anywhere, but Latasha, your organization, Black Voters Matter, is calling for a new federal agency to protect voting rights nationwide. You told the Alabama political reporter that, quote, a Department of Democracy Woo! That's right. would actively look at the patchwork of election systems across the 50 states and territories. With federal oversight, mm. our nation can finally fix the lack of state accountability that currently prevails for failure to ensure our democratic right to vote. OK, we have to do this in, quote unquote, the world's greatest democracy. Mm. So we have to have a Department of Democracy. Hello. Um, Absolutely. And it should be independent. So, Latasha, can you talk more about what your organization is calling for? And given the backdrop of 2020, COVID-19, the militarization of the United States, that's my dog in the background. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, Bono, it's all happening. He's got something to say, and Maria. I feel you. I feel you, Latasha, because the thing that is underlying everything, mm. apart from the COVID, right, is this underlying fear of what the hell is going to happen with this election. And every yeah. single one of us is feeling it. So yeah. talk to us, Latasha. So I do want to separate that part of what the organization is asking for is the immediate restoration of the Voting Rights Act. As some who are listening, they may remember that in 2013, there was a Shelby versus Holder case that actually stripped out Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which essentially took the teeth out of the act because what it did, those states that had been egregious and had to come under preclearance, it eliminated that. Basically, the state's argument was, we don't need this anymore. Black people are voting. You know, we've got it under cover. It's fine. We don't need this kind of oversight. And we see how that happened immediately after that ruling was made. What we saw is the massive closing of polling sites all over the country. We started seeing voter ID laws pop up. We started seeing the exact match where people were dropped from the voting rolls. And there is a report that the Brennan Center put out that in those states that would have been covered in the preclearance, when you look at the hundreds of thousands of people who were dropped from the voting rolls, 80 percent for exact match, 80 percent of those people are brown and black people. This mm. is wow. an attack mm. on our communities in particular. But uh, mm -hmm. aside from that, I do want to say that what Black Voters Matter has been calling for immediately is that the immediate restoration of the Voting Rights Act. The House has actually renamed it in light of in celebration of the life and legacy of John Lewis. And it's now it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act that Congresswoman Sewell pushed from Alabama and is sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk now waiting to be passed. I do want to separate and distinguish what I am asking. I'm saying we've got to take it a step further. And that's why I'm talking about the Department of Democracy. In some ways, we've got to understand that there's been some complicitness between both oh, parties completely. in terms yes. of participation. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got half the population that are not voting. When I look at Kentucky, in the last Kentucky election, you had a Democratic governor and you had a Republican secretary of state who made a decision that in Jefferson County, where 50 percent of the African-American population for the whole state live in that county. Right. They reduce it down to one voting no. site. See, that's yeah. one polling site for six hundred and twelve thousand people. Come on, y'all. Yeah. yeah, no, it's right in our face. And it it's hard to believe because it is so right in our face. Right. So as of this recording, mm. we're recording Monday afternoon, Joe Biden. Still has not announced his pick for vice president. Knows? Aaron Haynes wrote this in the 19th, quote, Last week began with racial and gendered attacks against some of the black women that Joe Biden could choose as his running mate, yeah. a decision he is expected to announce in the coming days. That criticism, combined with the news Friday night that Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, a white woman, had met with Biden to discuss the possibility of joining him on the ticket, was met with anger and frustration by many black women strategists, activists, organizers and voters who have reached a point where they believe choosing a black woman vice presidential nominee is no longer a recommendation, but a requirement. Mm. So, Tina, mm. we're in this moment of racial justice 
and reckoning, demanding systemic change. We know that with Biden as vice president, millions of people were deported under his watch. Also, mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter movement was formed out of numerous racist police violence cases that happened while he was vice president. Incarceration was still an issue. So the current moment that we're in is calling for real change. So do you believe that, for example, former prosecutor Kamala Harris Mm. or a former police chief like Val Demings could bring the energy that is needed for voters? And I'm I mean, yeah, yeah, give us your vice presidential take (laughs) from North Carolina. And also, like, what are you hearing when you're you're out there doing your shopping for your fabulous food stuff? (laughs) What are you hearing online at the grocery store, Tina Vasquez? (laughs) I mean, I have less to say about his potential vice presidential pick than I do just Joe Biden, because <laughs> I, still I, the Joe Biden part. Okay. I can't I can't get past it. I've covered immigration for my adult life. My feeling is that people are very forced to vote for Joe Biden. It's not my sense that anyone is excited to vote for Joe Biden. I am not excited about the election. I'm doing these security trainings for women journalists, and we're actively talking about what the country might devolve into around the election if Trump doesn't leave or if he's voted out. Um, So I have so much panic around the election that I can't even Hmm. I can't even get into it sincerely. There are probably people who feel that way. Sure. Yeah. Latasha, I mean, you know, in the same article in the 19th, you're actually quoted and you said this not having a black woman on the ticket could also mean a heavier lift for the black women doing the work of registering Mm -hmm. and turning out the black vote in the midst of a pandemic. We show up, we do the work. This will absolutely determine whether we show up or show out. All right, Latasha. I mean, (laughs) break it down. Tell me your thoughts. I mean, it's obvious, like at the end of the day, I mean, what argument he has, the only argument I've been hearing from the campaign, even when they've been floating around names like Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. And I'm thinking to myself, like you're talking about the white Midwestern voter. Well, if if Joe Biden can't pull them, then we already up the creek. (laughs) (laughs) You you got one job. That was your job. Supposedly, (laughs) you are the candidate to pull the white working class voter. That's what you said. Black people in South Carolina took you at your word that you were going to deliver. Like, so you deliver them. What we're saying is give us something to work with so we can deliver our community because people aren't excited about him. And even when I go back, I just, I just gotta, just gotta say this. Even when I go back to the comment that he made at the NABJ meeting, I'm thinking Mm -hmm. to myself, has anybody told him that there are Black Latinos? Nobody saw them. <laughs> Newsflash. <laughs> Newsflash. There's Afro Latinos out there. There's Afro Latinos. So I'm I'm so confused. But to get back <laughs> on point, right? I think that is really important and critical. You gotta know what time and what season you're in. That ultimately, even for me, I came out and supported, I endorsed Elizabeth Warren. I think Elizabeth Warren is an amazing candidate. I think she is an amazing person, but I also have to recognize what I am hearing and seeing on the ground and what I think it's going to take to win. And ultimately, there is no path to the White House that Joe Biden can get with winning Michigan or Pennsylvania if he does not have an extraordinary black turnout. That's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Latasha, before we move on, so who do you want? So who (laughs) is the black woman that you believe is going to energize that vote? So I I have a candidate. I do not say my candidate. Let me tell you why. Mm. Because I think that there's a larger point that I want to point to. This is what I think happens when we start talking about people of color. The idea is to take that person, tear them apart, and was like, see, we couldn't find anybody black that y'all wanted. He has a wealth of black women, qualified yeah. black women that he can choose from that is not a, just a one-time deal. Because oftentimes when they're looking at people of color, it's like you got to find the exceptional Negro. You got to find exceptional right. Latino, right? Yeah. We can't just be human beings. Right. We can't. And we need a black woman. And you've got a list of people who are more than qualified than half of the white presidents and the vice presidents that we've already had. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> right. saying. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so beyond the presidential race, right, there's a lot of progressives who have won in other primaries. So, for example, last week, 
Cori Bush, who is a nurse, single mom, Black Lives Matter activist, That's right. won against the long-term centrist incumbent William Lacey Clay in Missouri. This summer after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amara Arbery, Nina Pop, and so many more were taken from us. Yes. Millions of people were taken to the streets around the world to join us, to join those who had said for years, starting in this place, that yes. Black Lives Matter. Yes. 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 We've been called radical. Yeah. Terrorists. Yeah. We've been dismissed as impossible, uh, as an impossible fringe movement. That's what they call us. But now, we are a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-faith mass movement, united in demanding change, in demanding accountability, in demanding that our police, our government, our country recognize that Black lives do indeed matter. And that these are not just words or symbolic gestures, Come on. but with concrete actions, and, sh- and we will measure those with our outcomes. So that was Cori Bush giving her acceptance speech. And if she wins this November, which is looking very likely, she will become Missouri's first black woman in Congress. Take a moment there. Last week, also, Representative Rashida Tlaib won by a landslide. So everyone's like, oh, oh, she won and she won big. And then last month, a former educator, Jamal Bowman, ousted long-term incumbent and centrist Elliot Engel in New York. And Mondaire Jones won a house race in the suburbs of New York City. And he'll likely become one of the first openly gay Congress members, along with Richie Torres in the Bronx. So at the same time, you have black and POC progressive candidates winning local primaries. You also have Democrats looking like they can take the Senate if they win three to four seats. And while Democrats did endorse five candidates of color for the Senate, they also blocked black candidates. So it's honestly a reflection. I don't even know if it's called ongoing tension anymore. Like there's just <laughs> shit going on in the Democratic Party. There's a there, this is like a fight, and that anyone that criticizes it, the, if you criticize the status quo right now, it's like forget it. Right? The Democratic Party doesn't seem to want to feel some truth about this because there's almost like this. We have to be Trump and. You know, we got to worry about state and Republicans on the state and local level. But it feels to me that that memo is being missed. So, Latasha, let me start with you. This political dissonance between that's what's happening on the street and the same old tired and true method that Democrats insist on. Right. Even though it cost them the 2016 election. I mean, I feel like. They're just repeating the same mistakes. And I want to, what's your take? So let me just start by saying racism is not a partisan issue. (laughs) True. (laughs) So let's be honest around what we're talking about, that part of the structural racism in this country has been equally distributed in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. And Mm -hmm. so what you're seeing, even with these new candidates, that you are seeing communities rise up and new generations of voters saying they want a more reflective democracy. That even what we have in Congress right now, when you think about uh, their majority women in this country than men, but we're severely underrepresented. And so what we know is there is a shift and a push on the traditional power structure, and that includes the Democratic Party. We're seeing this tension around not just having party leadership and party power, because in some ways, people are frustrated with the political parties, both political parties, because they have themselves been locked out, that the parties have not done enough to really reflect what the citizenry looks like. Mm -hmm. With the demographic shifts, what is happening is that as more people of color are getting engaged, what we're going to start seeing, we're seeing the whole political landscape shift. And that is what's happening. Even to the extent that you're saying these people of color win office, it's not because the party has been rallying like, yay, 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 that's who we want. (laughs) It's because people have been doing that. That ultimately, many of those candidates had their own organization on the ground in spite of the party. Several of those candidates were the underdog candidate that actually went up against. Some of them were literally looking at You know, we almost saw that in Kentucky where there was an establishment candidate that the established Democratic Party were behind someone. And then you had this progressive candidate to come in. 
fundamentally what we are up against right now. And I think what we're seeing, we are in this space around whether it's people or party who's actually going to move towards power in this country. And so who I'm with is I'm standing with the people to the extent that people get engaged to it. The party is going to have no choice for the shift and change. And so they're resisting right now. But it's normal for them to resist because they've also been complicit in the perpetuation of white male leadership. Hence why we are where we are right now in this whole discussion around Biden picking a black VP. The folks are acting like we're asking for a Martian, like we're asking for something that is just like unreasonable. <laughs> like the idea that black women would ask yeah, for a black yeah. VP, oh my God. <laughs> my God, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Tina, any, any thoughts before we move on on this? I mean, I can't disagree with Latasha. I feel it's my job to criticize uh, both sides That's my job. And Democrats have given journalists more than enough to go on all of the fails for all of the years. All right, we're going to turn to immigration now and we want to talk about. Yeah, we're going to talk about that Netflix show, which I'm not going to watch. But first, um, I want to give a platform to what immigration reporting actually should look like. Yep. So a year ago, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, raided seven meat processing plants, chicken processing plants in six towns in central Mississippi detaining nearly 700 undocumented immigrants, making it the largest single state workplace raid in history. Last week on Latino USA, uh, Miguel Macias and I reported when we were down there. Lorena knows this community like few other people in the area, and she saw what the raids did to them. This was immediately after a beautiful quinceañera for his daughter, um, community helped out and they got her a used dress and it was beautiful. And I talked to him to congratulate him and said, what a beautiful, you know, dance. And he was wearing a grillete. That's one of those ankle shackles we've mentioned before. He said, I'm worthless. And I was like, how could you say that? Look at your your daughter. She's like, he's like, I can't provide for them. But this is not what things will look like in the future, Lorena says. What people are seeing now are people that are just destroyed and broken. But that's not what they are. You know, they're survivors. Those communities in Forest and in Morton, you know, where they've seen a a doubling of students, because kids are still going to school. They're still graduating. They're still going to quinceañeras. They're still having baptisms. They're still going to church on Sundays. Packed. And they're... They're grateful that they're in this country and they don't want to leave. And and they want to stay in Mississippi, by the way. They they love Mississippi. They love Mississippi. And that's Lorena Quiroz Lewis. Uh, She was our guide in Mississippi and also has been one of our guests uh, for one of our In the Thick shows live in Jackson this past February before the pandemic. Tina, you also interviewed Lorena Quiroz Lewis recently for PRISM and you spoke to her about the raids And how now COVID-19 is devastating the immigrant community in Mississippi. Right. And Tina, you've also been covering family separation in a recent story for PRISM that you wrote. I'm quoting, as the COVID-19 pandemic rips through immigrant detention centers, federal immigration authorities are presenting parents detained alongside their children with a, quote, binary choice. Remain detained together where a deadly virus is spreading or send their children away to live with sponsors. Government vetted relatives living in the U.S., media outlets nationwide have blamed this latest episode of cruelty on the Trump administration. But evidence suggests that for several years, a similar binary option triggering family separation has been promoted by a lauded immigration attorney long responsible for representing thousands of detained children. Los Angeles, California based lawyer Peter Shea, who I know. But who I haven't spoken to mm. since all of this because I've been a little bit busy, but I'm I'm, I'm going um, <laughs> <laughs> to I'm giving him a call. <laughs> I'm going to. It connects to the 1997 Flores Settlement Agreement. And you've heard this before. Peter Shea at that time was a lead counsel for that. At the end of July, a California federal judge denied the nonprofits um, Aldea. There's a couple of Aldea. There's Raices. And so a federal judge denied their attempt to intervene on behalf of the children who are detained with their parents in these family detention camps. I don't call them centers. They're a camp. Tina, can you tell us what you found out in your reporting 
and how this man, Peter Shea, could trigger what these activists from Aldea and Raices and attorneys are now calling something quite horrible. They're calling it family separation 2.0. So I, you know, I'd been covering family detention centers for a really long time. And so I was familiar with many of the attorneys who are on the ground in family detention centers representing detained families. And so I started to hear a lot of chatter about Peter Shea, um, which was like wildly uncomfortable because if you read anything related to Flores, Peter Shea is everywhere. Like he is right. the attorney behind Flores. Right. But what I was hearing was that it was their feeling that he has not had the best interest of detained children in mind for a very long time and that he wasn't advocating the way that he could have been on behalf of children who are detained alongside their parents. Um, but like the biggest allegation really was that for many years since the Obama administration expanded family detention around 2014, they alleged that he'd been advocating for what they were calling the binary choice protocol, mm. which would, you know, at the front end of the asylum process, not when a, a parent has gone through the entire process and it's, you know, it's become apparent that their case isn't going to shake out the way that they want. And then they have to face this really tough decision at the beginning of the process, he wanted to present parents with this option, which is essentially your kid can remain detained with you in this family detention center, right. but you will be here maybe indefinitely. We can't give you a time frame for how long it will take for your case to be adjudicated, which is in violation of Flores because children aren't supposed to be detained longer than 20 days. Or you can just release your kid to a sponsor in the U.S., but it would be very murky and unclear what would happen? Like, are you terminating your parental rights? Would you be reunited with your child? What happens if you get deported without your child? So all of this was like murky and unclear. But according to them, this is what Peter Shea had been pushing for years during the family separation policy. And as it turned out, I went through court records. Look and at you, you star <laughs> reporter. Well, it was it was shocking to me. This has been a government, no matter the administration, that has always fought to keep families in detention, right? Like they don't want to release them. They have not particularly cared about family separation, but there were these like court transcripts, I want to say 2017, but also around 2015, where Peter Shea is like explaining what this protocol would look like. And he says something like, you know, the government makes it look like it would be the end of the world to do this, but really it's a very simple process. And what he describes essentially would trigger a family separation. So let's move on to our final segment, which is La Ultima y Nos Vamos, or Last Call. So here we go, right? For our final segment, this is, I just want to say, we are doing this show because I started watching the Netflix docuseries that, I'd say I hate watched it, Immigration Nation. <laughs> Need more officers? Right, we need, uh, they're not telling me nothing. If you don't mind, can you just go look at them? I'll tell you everything that's going on. I'm going to, Dave, I'm going to explain to the daughter what's going on. Yep. Uh, I'm the one. He was deported for. It's, it's actually a federal offense to come back to the country. So I have a warrant for his arrest. Can I see the warrant? I'm not obligated to show it to anybody. I have a warrant, trust me. I'm not in here without it. All right, I have a warrant for his arrest. I got to take him to the Southern District of New York. He's going to be remanded today. Okay, but I need, can I see any paperwork? Yeah, I'll give you a card. No, I mean like a paperwork saying that you guys have well, uh, sure. permission to come in here or oh, something. Oh, no, I, 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 have, I have a warrant for him and I know he lives here. So that's why I'm in here. Plus you open the door and let me in. So it's been reported that the Trump administration and ICE tried to get the filmmakers to hold on airing the series until after the November election. It's a rare look. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to just go with what the filmmakers say, but I'm, I'm doing it. If you could see, if this was a video show right now, if I was on television, I'd be like heat miser with my smoke coming out of my ears. Uh, this, this documentary has just pissed me off so much. So anyway, the documentary looks is a rare look at the inside of ice and the deportation regime of this country. As we all know, as journalists who've covered immigration for years, that getting access to ICE and even simple questions getting answered 
is nearly impossible. But all of a sudden, the directors, Charles Schwartz and Christina uh, Clusau, they told Ivan Villarreal of the Los Angeles Times that they did sign a multimedia agreement with the Department of Homeland Security to get this access. And what we want to talk about is how white mainstream media journalists who, in the case of Schwartz, in, in his case, he's, he barely speaks Spanish. They're getting the access and they're actually doing apprehensions and they're the filmmakers there and they're like, we can't, we can't. Hey, can you sign this release, immigrant, as you're getting arrested? Like that, that's what's happening, right? That is in the interview and that is how these filmmakers created this documentary, which I find to be highly unethical and immoral, yeah. right? But, but journals of color, right? Immigration reporters, We've been covering these stories for years and are connected to and sometimes part of these immigrant communities. So we see this film as almost being violent, right? So, Latasha, I want to start with you because I feel like this is beyond, this is not just a immigration story. Because mm -hmm. I feel like when I was watching it, I was thinking of cops. I was thinking about even images of you know, how Chicago is having is being portrayed right now in the mainstream media. To me, it feels like tragedy porn, immigration porn, violence porn. And I personally think that this does not serve underrepresented communities. So, Latasha, what do you think? Absolutely. The first thing I want to say is that we have made people reduce people to a political pawn. These are human beings. What is wrong with folks? Like at the end of the day, this isn't about the story to the extent that you're more interested in telling a story than acknowledging that these are human beings that are going through a traumatic experience. What is wrong with you? Mm. I think part of what we have to do is we've got to stop everybody from exploiting human beings, mm. exploiting our people. At the end of the day, where is your center? Where is your moral center? And it has to be unacceptable. I still am pissed off. I pray every night for those children that have been placed in cages. Mm. We've actually normalized that and made that be a political point. Those are children. Those are someone's children, whether they're from Peru or Colombia or Mexico. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, what we have to be is enraged that we are seeing human beings be treated and re be reduced to a storyline. The story has no value if who they are and their being is not a value. And so, like, it infuriates me. I have to, like, even calm down to even think about that. That's one. You're like heat miser. You're like me with the <laughs> fire coming out with the hair. But what's oh, yeah. your second point? Yeah, the second <laughs> point is around... We already know this relationship. So you got to you got to deal with with Homeland Security under this Trump administration. We supposed to trust you. Like at the end of the day, come on now. Like if it looks like a duck, quick like a duck is a duck. Yes. The bottom line that there's something that is not right in terms of why are they giving you that kind of access? Right. And then the third piece around that, too, is we also put some pressure on Netflix and on the network around. We have to hold folks accountable that continue to make ex stories that exploit our pain. It is unacceptable. It, if we're not going to hold folks accountable, because part of what undermines our work that we're doing in brown and black communities is that this narrative, there's a particular narrative that always victimizes us, that always puts us in a particular kind of light, that always gives it from a particular perspective that actually undermines our humanity and who we are. And so I think I think that there is that I could talk about this is a whole nother podcast series itself. So I'll just stop there. Let's just get Latasha her own podcast. <laughs> series. <laughs> Tina, if this is the most damning look at immigration that ICE and the Trump administration didn't want seen, yet it was developed with the Department of Homeland Security's approval, then, I mean, seriously, how can we expect change? I mean, it's really perceived as quite exploitative. So, Tina, your feelings as a reporter who, like me, has covered this issue thoughtfully for years and years and years and I'm telling you, I still haven't seen it because I don't want to get my blood pressure up. So, Tina? I was so goddamn mad watching the first one for a mm. lot of reasons. Okay. I imagine that if you are an undocumented immigrant in this country, it's been like screaming into a void, right? Like, I don't know how many times undocumented folks subject to enforcement in this country have told me everything that people are watching in this documentary and then you reach out to ICE and they deny it. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it, it is enraging that it requires 
a documentary for people to to hear and to understand that this has been happening for a really long time and to understand as a reporter that ICE just lies to your face. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the amount of times, the number of times that I've asked about collateral arrests. And I've been told that that's not a thing that ICE does, that I am misleading, that my reporting is bad. And then to see it happen in the first episode, I, I didn't want to watch anymore. I was so goddamn angry. And when I think about like trying to make it through the series, I literally get shaky because I have seen for years, seen for mm. years the way that this agency has terrorized immigrant communities. And I don't want to fucking watch it. Like I can't watch it. It's painful to watch. And it's painful to know that people are going to consume this on Netflix and then go about their day and nothing changes. And ICE keeps operating the way that ICE has always operated. Mm. And and can I just add one part to that? Yeah. Oftentimes the way that it normalizes trauma. Mm -hmm. And so what makes it dangerous, I think that some of the stories, because the way the story is told, there's some components in that, that yes, seeing ICE lie is one thing, but the way in which a story is told, which is why it's always important that who tells the story can actually put it in a framework that it actually normalizes our trauma and people continue to go on by their business. So that's the danger in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I will say, um, I saw the whole thing. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, and I, first of all, Tina, your feelings, I know my name is not going to watch it and I respect that because I was like, I'll take, I'll take one for the team. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this, Tina, about it. It becomes a voyeuristic journey. Mm. So even the migrant voices and the faces to me are seen as, I don't want to say caricatures, but I want to say like, it's like museum reporting. Mm. You are really not part of the community. You're That's coming right. in and trying to create this quote unquote fuller picture without understanding that state violence is going to say whatever the hell they want. Yeah. And, and that's the part where I get, I get, I got really upset as to how these filmmakers think that they're doing someone a service when in fact they're putting these migrants. I'll, I'll give you this one specific example. The migrant names, they're giving them the last names are in the, the captions, mm. the ice employees. You only did their first name. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about that. So they might be being celebrated by white liberals. And I've gotten into Twitter rows with people about this. And I'm like, this is a white liberal take to make feel like, oh, now immigration's an issue. And I'm, I'm with you, Tina. I'm like, fuck that. Yeah. Because this is a real thing. And stop exploiting migrant communities. That's right. And actually follow reporters that are part of the community and have known this issue for years and are doing it the right way. And I don't care these filmmakers might say whatever they want. This was immoral. This was unethical. Mm. And and that needs to be called out. Right. Mm. ITT All-Stars, Tina Vasquez, senior reporter with PRISM and uh, Type Investigations 2020, Ida B. Wells Fellow and Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Thank you so much for joining Julio and me on this episode of In the Thick. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm Maria Hinojosa. And I'm Julio Ricardo Varela. Remember, dear listener, go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review us. It really helps us. Also, now you can listen to In the Thick on Pandora, Spotify, wherever you decide to get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at In the Thick Show. Like us on Facebook and tell your friends and family to listen. In the Thick is produced by Nicole Rothwell, Noor Saudi, and our New York Women's Foundation Ignite Fellow, Harsha Mahata, with editorial support from Erica Dilde. Our audio engineers are Stephanie LeBeau, Julia Caruso, and Leah Shaw. Our digital editors, Luis Luna. Our intern is Ariel Goodman. Thanks to Raul Perez for recording me. The music you heard is courtesy of National Captain ZZK Records. See you on our next episode, dear listener. Ciao. Bye, guys. All right. So everyone's uploading right now. Um, Latasha, you're at 13%. Uh, Tina is at 2 So this is like... You know what this is like? You know those like horse races <laughs> that you see at the at the carnivals? It's like right now, Latasha Brown, 26%. Right. It's like right. you start spraying the water. <laughs> no, the computer is like, she's loud. We can hear her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah, the computer's like, okay, she talks a lot. We gotta get her off. No. The opinions expressed by the guests and contributors in this podcast are their own 
and do not necessarily reflect the views of Futuro Media or its employees.